the bit that I found out that genuinely made me a little bit sad about this podcast. The yeah. first time we did one, you don't play the banging theme music live. Welcome to Thinking Deeply About Primary Education, the podcast that gives you a peek inside the minds of some truly inspirational teachers. This week, I'm delighted to be joined by Stuart Tiffany. Hi, Stuart. How are you? I am pretty good, thank you. Uh, recording this in summer, which means obviously the weather's been awful, so we haven't been able to leave the house. So uh, no complaints. Yeah, plenty of rain. I went back to Ireland where I expect to have plenty of rain. I don't expect it when I come back. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's August for you. You've been on the podcast a few times before? Yep in different guises um but it, you know one of the things i've always wanted to do is, is speak to you sort of more in depth and really explore your thinking and as luck would have it you've put all your thinking into one collection of pages to which we'll we'll arrive later and um, but we always begin with our our guests and numbers just to get a feel for who you are where you're from and my first question to you is years as a teacher 12 ish because i had a break midway between years as a history lead Five-ish, because I'm being really neurotic about it being full years or not. I mean, I really want to. I really want to quantify that now. The reason it's five-ish is because, ironically, since I set up Mr. Tedas Primary History, I haven't actually led history once, but I've always been in the backgrounds, lurking and being the you know the hidden partner in all but name. That's why it's ish. Nice. So yeah, so so that number could rise then, if you depend on how you how you measure it. Yeah. <laughs> And then if you go compound and you have lots of different schools at the same time. <laughs> oh, steady on. First year group taught? Three. Last year group taught? Four. Most important year group? Uh, ankle by to land, which is obviously, as we know, early years. Favourite year group? Four. Number of largest primary history Facebook groups? Uh, one, the largest primary history Facebook group, which has just topped 13,000 members today, which is pretty wild. And also the largest primary history teaching Facebook page, which, you know, algorithm wise is slightly different. That's amazing. I mean, I'm not on Facebook, so I don't understand how it works these days at all. Whenever I was there, I think it was available in universities. <laughs> so. Wow, that's a while ago. Um, the easiest way to think about it is it's Overall, it's quite often less informed than Twitter. And yes, I'm still going to call it Twitter, but it's less of a bin fire. <laughs> yeah, that bin fire keeps coming up every episode these days. Oh, I can imagine. <laughs> yeah, considering we've, we've driven so many people towards it as well. You know, you've got people who've joined in 2021, 22. Oh, no. well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I was on Facebook before. What's the shop called? Is it Facebook? Where you can sell stuff? No idea. Never heard of it. There's like a there's like a marketplace. Marketplace, yeah. Before ah, that, before that. But my wife talks about it because she sells lots of the boys' toys and things on there. So I've got a I've got a, a toe in the water, but I don't understand it at all. <laughs> Books written? Uh, just the one at the moment, and no intention of following up with a second anytime soon. And the most important question: tweets. Well, I mean, can we even call them tweets anymore? Um, but my gut instinct is if you can't start calling them X's, it gives it a really different slant on a personal interview. Uh, 11,466. Impressive. Yes, I mean, yeah, I mean, this has come up because it's been a while since I asked anybody about tweets and things have changed quite a lot. Um, I think I'm going to stick with calling Twitter. I find the, the X quite jarring. And I think it's sort of almost moved me away from the compulsion to click the little bird. Yeah, um, so yeah, possibly a good thing, and I might just stick it on, stick to browser using, you know, because I'm not going to leave entirely unless something goes horribly wrong. But uh, yeah, I think it's definitely changed how I use social media. I think. So now the focus of this episode is going to centre around primary history, but you're a teacher, school leader, history specialist, CPD provider, visiting lecturer, and author. Tell us about your journey and how you got here. 
I'm not going to use this podcast as a sales pitch for the book because that I try. I, I'm, I, I'm not adept enough to do it naturally, and therefore it's really clunky and cringy. So if I mention it occasionally, that's where it kind of adds value to the answer. If you read the first chapter of the book, it really goes into where my love of history comes from. Um, and I still smirk at my very nerdy comments, my lovely granddad about the age of eight, where I said, do you know what, granddad, history is my passion, which is horrifically cringeworthy. But loved it the whole way through school, really, you know, did it for GCSE, A-level. Um, I did one of the old style teaching degrees, a little bit like a joint honours, where a uh, four-year undergraduate um, with some degree level history, a bit like a joint honours, as I say. Um, not all history is fun. Two semesters on Victorian agriculture, going through all the minutiae I was grim, but never mind. As a teacher, taught in Leeds and Bradford, that's where I'm based and started there 2010 and taught on and up pretty much the whole way through since. Um, how did I acquire history as a lead, subject to lead? By luck, as it so often happens in primary schools, the previous lead took on computing, which is what he specialised in, which, you know, will smile and nod at the bizarreness of how subjects are allocated. Um, in terms of developing that specialism, it's kind of grown from there. I'm very lucky to uh, have kept in contact with my primary history lecturer, a lady called Bev Forrest, who is History Primary on Twitter and Primary History Matters uh, on Facebook. And she's got me starting to write for the Pri uh, Historical Association's Primary History magazine, which was just ideas, assemblies, that kind of thing. And it just generally just grew from there. Uh, 2017, joined the HA's primary committee. So you get a very different view of the subject. And then it's really blossomed from there. I set up Mr. Tedas Primary History as a bit of fun. Didn't expect it to turn into a company, but there we go. Um, and that's kind of blossomed from there. And from there, I've got opportunities to do the skit lecturing, undergraduate lecturing at a former university, which is, um, it was weird to go back in, a, back in another role, but very enjoyable one. Um, and then, yeah, it's a very simple message of, I really like primary history. I love teaching history and learning history. And all I will, all it's there to do in a nutshell is kind of offer ideas and help to those that ask for it. History is one of those subjects that you can get lost in big time. I mean, it was a, th a third of my B.Ed., um, but I never really, oh, well, I ended up as the atheist RE lead um, when I first got a subject <laughs> and then straight into maths. <laughs> wow. Okay. You know, but I mean, in those days, it meant organizing Christmas and Easter and special people then that kind of thing there was there yeah. was very little thought about curricular decisions to be made and stuff like that there yeah I mean the last two subjects I've left have been geography and our uh, geography and PE and you know my input on those I've done my best I've really worked hard to read around them but it's a shame that it's not you know if you've got a real specialist area that it can't be viewed favorably I know some place it is but often it isn't which is a, it is a shame I mean, you started by saying you weren't going to try and sell your book at all. But I think for me, I think it sells itself, you know, in terms of and, and, and it's linked to why I think your Facebook page became so popular. Like you say, you did it for a bit of a bit of fun, a bit of um, sort of engaging with your craft and your spare time. But it's because of the richness of thought and the time and effort you put into considering the, the minutiae of the subject. And, you know, I know that the first message Neil Allman sent when he received the book was that this is fantastic. You know, he's on there. Or, OK, I've got to get a copy of this. And I'm pretty sure he or Chris mentioned as one of their uh, what you're reading for us a couple of weeks ago. Um, and so I've, I've really enjoyed reading it. And I think that people will, too. But you don't need to sell things that are this rich in quality, I think. Oh, that's very good. That's very good of you. The the way I wrote it, the best way to describe the book um, was I sent a draft copy to another member of the primary committee who I've known for a while and I regard in the highest of opinions. And her reply was, I really enjoy it and it's very you. And what I took from that after clarifying it with her was a really simple thought, a really simple thing of it is how I think, how I talk, how I work. And to me, that's really important. Um, I wrote it to be useful to, for teachers, but with no specific teacher in mind, as every teacher is slightly different and nuanced and it, it tries to be clear without prescriptive. And it's one of those moments of kind of reading it and going, oh, but what if they think this? And what if you think that? And I spoke to a friend who'd written extensively and she said, 
but you want them to pro you want it to provoke a thought process you're giving them uh, you're giving them enough to have to start them off but it takes them along at oh this could that's that's the way so it's not a kind of prescriptive encyclopedia of do this then this then this it's here are the broad principles and then let's think about how this can work for you as um something i encounter a lot is when people buy in commercially produced schemes and i've, I've written for a couple of them it's the bit that i wish it said on the front of the scheme but it won't because it'd be a terrible sales pitch is i've never met your children i've never been to your school i probably don't even know the area make this work for you and in a nutshell that's why the structure of the book is there with the kind of additional guidance specifics um in there really yeah i mean you can even see by the way you've structured it that you're you've given a lot of consideration to high teachers digest material as well you know with a little bit here then there's the content and there's a little bit more that re reviews that content you know i think yeah massively helpful because you know we always start the the chat episodes by talking about how time poor teachers are you know it's our, basically our strap line you know yeah. and that that counts for time for for reading and the more teachers we can get engaged with reading if it's through where you know ways that we know will make things accessible then that's fantastic yeah it's um it's also one of the reasons why um when i was kind of discussing it with the publisher um to start with and the, and they they basically said your target is about 40,000 words you can blitz that if you try but if we want this to work for teachers, it has to be detailed enough to be user friendly, but brief enough not to require three months to digest. So it's, it's, it's not going to lie. It was a horrible balance to strike. <laughs> Many editings happened. Yeah, no one's ever given me that kind of criteria. <laughs> <laughs> Just think about think about how many models and images you're using in your. <laughs> oh, I didn't even know that was a thing until they gave me the outline. And it was, well, if you use an image, it's 400 words off your word count. But once if it's a smaller picture, yeah, I, I bet they were sick of my daft questions. I really do. Yeah. Well, you can imagine what the, the restrictions are like whenever there's a whole chapter called Models, Images and Representation. <laughs> <laughs> Just a little bit. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I mean, I was going to ask at the end about why the world need this book, but I, I think you've, you know, you've, we've gone straight to quite the final question already. But I think most of the questions have come from our chats before and things that we might be able to elaborate on. And also bits of the book, as I read and thought, oh, it'd be really interesting to know about that or, or like, you know, the side streets around that mm. idea, that kind of thing. And so we've discussed the importance of locality before. I think it was a Christmas was the last time. Yep. But I think we need some context before my next question. So how local is local history? And how do we become sufficiently expert in our school's local history so that we can execute a role as effectively as we might hope? So I, I had to go. Uh, this is um, the original kind of answer to this is something very flippant, which is uh, three and three quarter miles uh, as the crow flies. But I'll be slightly more literal just in case people take things seriously. If we want a, more, if we want a specific answer, we have to go back to the optional guidance from the national curriculum in the early 1990s. That's the only time that I found, and I spoke to colleagues kind of previously about this, and I'll, I'll just, I've copied it down just so you can see how vague this is. It gave an example of a village or rural area, a town or city or an area within a town or a city, a county or a region. So let's be honest, you can pretty much get it away with most things. However, my preferred metaphor, which I did put in the book, is this idea of ripples in a pond in that if we just teach locality as an isolated snapshot, I think we've not done it justice because every time we encounter locality, it helps to give us a different sense of the past of our immediate area. For example, where I went to high school, um, there was a place called Cheney Basin, which is basically, it just is a bit of a hill, but that was a Norman Mott and Bailey castle. And you could literally go your whole life going, well, that's a really weird little piece of, you know, it's a bit weird piece of topography, but actually it was a very strategic decision to put things there. So when we're thinking locality, why not start with the school itself if it's, you know, Victorian, because quite a few are, then ripple outwards to the street, the village. The local church is beautiful in many cases and so often disregarded because they think it's too obvious. To a child at the age of six, 
they don't have that sense of the world, but kind of introducing them and kind of just gently nudging them to go, that's been here for several hundred years. The town was built around this. And it's those things. And then when we get into key stage two, don't just see it as a token bolt on, as I said before. What's your local Roman settlement of importance? Because that's probably a settlement that's still there. For me, it's York. It's always chuffing York. But think about, you know, like Chester, London, Colchester, St. Albert, all, all of those. And think, use that local example to teach a national story. So if you're teaching the Romanization of Britain, well, let's use a place and they might be able to go and visit. And then you say, do you think this was the only one? Do you think this is the only city? Well, no. Oh, how did they connect it? Roads. Oh, do you remember when we learned about road networks? This is how Britain was connected. And it's that sense of, you know, going from there and then becoming experts in it. The thing is, local history doesn't behave in the same way as a broader unit. It is different because it's based around your locality. Unless you're really, really lucky, you don't have a national, you know, a world renowned or nationally renowned event. You know, unless like, I don't know, you're the centre of London, therefore the Great Fire of London is literal local history. Then the way in which you need to look into it is different but it's about crafting something really purposeful and beautiful. So number one, you need to start earlier. You can't just think, oh, I'm teaching it next half term. It is one you need to start earlier with. And I know teachers are time poor, but once you've got that time investment in, it's there. The local history is probably not going to change as much as it's unlikely to have an extensive archaeological dig along it. Then number two, speak to people, speak to your teaching assistants, your dinner time staff who live in the community. What are those local stories that are really interesting, but not very well known? And last but not least, speak to your local library. If you've got a museum, go and drop them an email, say, what local history do we have here? Because we want to make more of it. Local archives, all of those cool stories are really interesting. This one, take with a pinch of salt. If you've got a local community Facebook group, ignore the right-wing politics like let's call it but then think really carefully about well let's just ask because if you don't ask you don't know and then the key thing that kind of run through many of my answers is remember history has the word story in it for a reason so before you start teaching once you've got that kind of wealth of information what story are we taking the children along what's that narrative arc that we want them to go through in order to develop that you know, sense of understanding. Yeah, we used to joke that all our educational visits went to Rochester High Street when I worked in Medway. But in, in that one little street, you've got maybe a couple of thousand years worth of history. You know, the castle at one end and oh, the, yeah. the Dickens House at the other end and all these Tudor buildings and stuff like that there. In a school I used to work at as well, um, their local history was, um, oh gosh, where was it? It was York to tie in with um, the uh, Anglo-Saxon, Romans, Anglo-Saxon Vikings. But there was a there was a mill across the road on the high street that was being refurbished and made into kind of real lo local community hub. And it was literally there. And it was, well, why are we doing that? And then there was another school I worked with. They were looking at um oh, they, they were looking at uh, kind of they wanted to tie into the Second World War, but they literally had a, a mill down the road that was the largest mill of its kind when it was built. And I don't I don't denigrate teachers who don't know because history is massive you know it's the story of humanity what we three million years depending on which start point we choose from good old po ancients podcast which i know you're a fan of as well it's great um but it's that sense of going have you ever asked because if you don't ask you don't know yeah absolutely yeah i remember when lloyd moved to a school in staplehurst we were talking about how old maidstone was because maidstone's been there I mean, almost from the dawn of man, yeah. you know, there's been something on, the, on that part of the river. I think it's a, cro a good crossing point, um, is possibly why. Um, possibly with a story about Alfred crossing the river at, at some point in Maidstone, at some point. Well, it wouldn't surprise, because um, there was one where I went to high school, there was, uh, just down the road is a place called Castleford, which is was a Roman fort, and it literally translates as castle by the fort. I think it's Anglo-Saxon when you get the word burr, yeah. in there being a fortified town it's those little stories going have you ever wondered why we're called this and it's just you know that richness that and go oh because you know children are going to go and tell the parents an excruciating number of times 
because it's caught their interest. It's there. It's tangible. I think tangible history is a really interesting thing, especially for younger, really younger children. Yeah, I think that's where the Bur- the Burn Bury St Edmunds comes from, isn't it? You know, because St Edmund obviously was a very important mm. Saxon saint, perhaps, or certainly I don't know, around about that time. My because he's also a they made him look like Christ, didn't they? Where he was getting the arrow shot into him, and then the wolf was beside his head. Um, yeah, I'd be lying if I said I knew for sure, but it sounds familiar. I know there is a saint where it was, yeah, there's a famous story. It might be him of. Um, well, you know, if you are, if you're God, God will protect you from these arrows. When, yeah, I think it's that one, but so there's a lot of history to remember. This is the, this is one of the, you know, most of the editing is me taking the bits out where I sound like a, a fool and, and probably my, you know, uh, a tangent about Burris and Evans is probably it. Um, but what I was saying is then Lloyd didn't know much about the history, obviously being from Wales. And um, so he and I discussed, well, this has been here for a long time. There must be a local a local unit within this and um and he did that he did exactly what you said he talked to people he found out and i know those kids were doing some really great field work um in directly in their local area you know nothing none of the sort of the i don't know what the the big ticket time periods but it was um it was really meaningful in terms of this is where we've come from and where our our locality has yeah i think it's it's really it's really key that um it, it has an important role and it's not just as um, Tim Lomas calls it fact grubbing where you just go and collect a load of random data and then you present it. Now it's a way to overlap history and geography because it's a natural way to get some geography field work, but it's more than that. It has to have value. You know, we have to, well, it's a, uh, we have to chew on the information. We've got to chew on it and savor it and really get our you know, kind of mental thought pressure down. Well, so what? One of my favourite phrases whenever I teach or lecture is the importance of going, so what? Why, 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 why should we remember this? And it's that, you know, that conclusive kind of avenue to go down is that's why the narrative arc, I think, is a really useful analogy for primary school teachers, because it, it has that, well, what's our ending? What's our conclusion? Even though we're not sure what avenue have we gone down and therefore what can we you know, really build in and think about? Nice. Yeah, I can, I can see how that could help with the trimming back the hinterland. Mm. You know, there, there's some topics you want to include absolutely everything, but you want to get a certain number but, of weeks. Don't you? Yeah, that's that's where kind of an aspect of the, the book is. Um, it's it's primary history. And that's why I kind of I do make reference to. You know, kind of links to subjects, the fact that, you know, let, I, as a teacher, I I. I went wrong in many a places, um, which is why I put them in there, because it made me giggle. Um, but it's that sense of, you know, the interconnected ki- curriculum. We get the richness and breadth in a way that a secondary departmental model can't. You know, because in secondary schools, the history and the geography uh, departments are really, um, you know, they're competing for time. They're competing for coverage. They don't necessarily work to build a more unified front as we do. And, you know, that hinterland is, Christine Council coined about five years ago. I think it's 2018 is when the blog, the big blog that took it off was. It's that, you know, think about the, you know, that story arc that you're saying on. It's not just a, uh, you know, a character stood there going, doo, 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 doo. I shall the fight. It's all of those background facilitations that, you know, really start to hone into that. Well, why? Why did that happen? What were they trying to accomplish? It's not an ice, history's not isolated snapshots. And if we're not careful, it can be. And that's why, you know, the background is so fundamental. And that's where, you know, a really good historical book, you know, storybook is so beautiful because it does that in an encapsulating way. You know, if we go down the Daniel Willingham, you know, route of stories being psychologically privileged, well, we naturally use them lots. So let's use them to our advantage. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, I, I listened to the, the Rest is History po- um, podcast and I can't remember which it's not Tom Holland, but his his sort of co-host has written lots of books for designed for eight to twelve year olds. And I keep meaning to go and look at them because I think that'd be quite you know, because sometimes when I look at uh, like I was looking at Celtic uh, mythology with my oldest the other day, and we realized very quickly that it was written for uh, an adult audience, but probably a very educated adult audience because they'd written in the way the Celts would have spoken or in, in the way the Irish language would have been constructed and stuff like that there. And uh yeah, so I think okay, right. We'll need to get some. Need to look at uh, how others have, have recorded these stories. Um, 
but he, even on Alfred, he got his, he wrote his own story, didn't he? He got his own people, to, you know, so he's, he's a genius. No wonder he's remembered as the greatest king in England's ever, oh, well, not even England, but the greatest king was, he's um, ever had. There's, um, I can't remember where this one came from. It might be a history hit. Um, and it was, um, I think it was about the, Spar- the Spartans, where it said, were the Spartans truly the greatest warriors? At which uh, point the uh, historian being spoke, uh, interviewed laughs and says, that's definitely what they would have you believe. And that that's why history is m- so much more than just here's a list of facts to learn. That's why we get that how historians study the past, that discipline and, um, you know, that disciplinary side. To say, well, it's why it's so key, because otherwise you will just blindly believe things. My, well, I love the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle. It's it's great fun to read, to unpick and go, oh, OK. One of the ones I do um, when teaching the conflict is unpick the about the raid on Lindisfarne because it mentions uh, dragons flying across the firmament. And then I'll just let that hang and see if any of the children go, uh, dra- dragons, dragons. But because they might have, you know, read or watched something like How to Train Your Dragon or because they just, you know, take are absorbing the information in context. I, I think I've had like one or two children over the years who've gone, were they really dragons? Were they really there? At which point we can then have a conversation going, no, that's what we would identify as figurative. They might not have called it figurative, but that's what the implication is. What could they be depicting there? And that's where you get that sense of it's not to be understood literally. And that's where if we go back to the earliest sort of mythology, that's why there's that essence of truth. And that's why there's that essence of you know, trying to explain the world around them. And that's why, is it okay to teach mythology in, um, you know, in a history lesson? Well, if you're making top trump cards, no, of course it's not. That's not a history lesson. However, if you use that as a way to understand culture, belief and society, well, yeah, because the way in which the Greeks viewed the role of the gods is slightly different to the others. I mean, Zeus was a very naughty boy, shall we say. And you don't find that's a really interesting caveat that you can make me genuinely believe they came down uh, to earth. And that's why kind of whenever we do teach primary history, it's about kind of taking on that story, but unpicking the story. Um, another analogy I very much I use probably too often is the fact that if we're teaching stories in history, that means the teacher is the narrator of the story because you know where the story is going you know what it means in the moment and you also know which knowledge matters even if that doesn't become apparent for another two lessons and that's why you can't just have a you know a generic topic title like um have used this before many moons ago rome is where the heart is didn't create it very much owned it at the time um but you can't just have a generic title you need clarity because you know in history we've got this massive story arc of everything we've not just got our little town we've got the whole country or this empire that spans continents well which part of that are we interested in and that's why if we focus on what we call historical enquiry you know in the te- within the teaching of history that's why that matters because we use you know, historically valid questions in order to teach them the what of the curriculum, which we know because it adds value to the question, but also the how of the curriculum, as in how is the past studied? How is this knowledge utilised? And how confident are we this is a valid depiction? And that's why, you know, it's one of those really big challenges that history presents is we're reading this story. But the problem is we don't actually know the story. You know, we're basing it. We're basing our thinking on two two words on a page quite often. But it's so vast. And something that I always say I, I've kind of t- occasionally get asked is, is, is there a, an easy way to do this? I'd love to say there was, but there isn't. It's hard conceptually it is difficult um if you ever want to wind geographers up and i'm saying this deliberately now because you're recording um if you ever want to you know wind geographers up you know say geography is a bit more straightforward because you know if you're teaching a river a river it's a river mate it, it don't matter which one you're looking at there are those features where you can look and go oh there's a source there's an oxbow lake do you, do you know what I mean? It's that it's that difference. It's so context dependent. And that's why, you know, if you think, you know, if you're a teacher listening to this and you think, what is the sticky knowledge for the Great Fire of London? 
it depends entirely upon the question you are asking, because without that, you could literally look at everything. Even though it only lasted, what, five days? So it's, yeah. Yeah, it's a tricky one. A lot of responsibility. You know, as, as I'm listening to you, and I'm thinking, yeah, so much responsibility on the shoulders of the teacher. It's obviously the systems we've got in place in school are vital. Um, I actually went on a Christopher Wren walking tour around some of his churches in the, in the, in the square mile. And uh, so for me, the important stuff about the Fire of London is the opportunities he had to subvert the, because uh, he, he would put Baroque designs mm. into his buildings, even though they weren't allowed to have uh, Roman Catholic uh, designs. And obviously the Baroque style was, was sort of a uh, yeah, Roman Christendom. Uh, a symbol and but uh, yeah so looking at these little tiny churches on like a uh, cheap side and stuff like that and thinking oh this is amazing <laughs> but yeah not for school. <laughs> the level of detail that you can go into and it's also selecting and lots of teachers um the recent there's some statistics put out recently um that history is the most popular subject to be deep dived after the core subject i think often because it plays such a dominant role in the curriculum which is both a blessing and a, you know and a curse but also because I think lots of teachers really like it because it's cool. It's cool and it's interesting. And you can have those really in-depth, tangential conversations that reveal a level of maturity from children that you might not get you know, elsewhere. I also think teachers, um, one thing that I think teachers might need to just have a word with themselves about, this is my controversial point for the afternoon, just because you loved it, doesn't mean it should still be on the curriculum we need to you know we do need to look beyond well we've always taught it we've got really good resources and it gets really good writing in case we're moderated yeah lots the most popular event beyond living memory in key stage one is the great fire of london by far i've got no i appear to have this reputation for hating it i don't hate it i would just like people to look beyond it you know my favorite one is i had a school in Oh, it was the northeast somewhere, and they were teaching the Great Fire of London. And like, have any of your children been there? No. Are they likely to go there? No. Have you thought about the first flight because there's an airport up the road? Have you thought about other options? Not saying don't do it, just saying you know think about that. Um, I really enjoyed having a conversation with Neil, uh, Neil Armand a while ago about um, you know he he's uh, school and as was now trust they teach Benin, and it's one where I can totally see why you teach it. My absolute favourite unit that I knew nothing about pre two thousand and fourteen fifteen is early Islamic history. It is utterly remarkable, yet the most popular non-European study remains the Maya. The Maya are fascinating. They're really interesting. And they are the only opportunity to teach you know, Mesoamerican history, that part of the world, in the primary curriculum. But it's let's think about the community. Let's think about which would be most powerful. Let's challenge some stereotypes. If your um, you know, locality has an issue with Islamophobia, well... Why wouldn't we teach them about that culture factually instead of through the tabloids, instead of through, you know, possibly parents who might have misunderstood or what they heard down the pub? That's why the curriculum is so powerful. You know, it explains how we got to where we are, but it also takes you beyond that immediacy. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a really interesting kind of difficult one. Lots of schools... You know, they've got so much content in there. And I look, Dylan William phrase on, I think it was Mind the Gap. He said, quite often a school curriculum is a mile wide and an inch deep. I really wish it would me that came up with that because it's beautiful, <laughs> but never mind. Um, but it's also, I think now that we've spent this time building a curriculum, it's not done. Now is the time to review our, you know, the whole curriculum, but let's keep it history because I have a vague sense of what I'm talking about. Let's look and go, is this the best choice? Do we need to spend one half term on everything? Well, we've got, I'm going to use Yorkshire as an example because it means I can elaborate a little bit more, but this applies wherever. Well, we've got York down the road. That was the capital of Roman, you know, Britannia Minor in, um, in the Roman period. Why are we spending half a term on the Romans and cramping that in? Why don't we spend more on that and less on that? Does it need to run for a full half term? No. 
can we be really savvy with time use and that's that to me is where that that next step is and that's why um you know in, in the book i've put in a curriculum map not as a this is the one you should follow but very deliberately as a let me show you a way that allows me to be savvy with time so i've put in short studies so um something like autumn two three weeks on the roman empire and then a half term on roman britain including york and it gives it room to maneuver then we've got the um, you know the early ancient civilizations overview that is literally perfect to, lead, to teach alongside rivers because all of them develop along the banks of a river and it's you know that's where being savvy with that that blocking i, I think is important and thinking how can you know the wider curriculum work as a coherent model to build you know build a more in-depth and but time savvy perspective yeah i think it goes right back around to what you said about not being precious about you know we've always done this so we should do it we've always had six week blocks or 12 week blocks so we, we always should have you know so I, I think you're on to something i think it's definitely you know, like you say the next thing to consider um for schools and being you know how do we use the time that we have in school and that includes not just the minutes but also the days the weeks and the and the terms for all of you Kofi, Kofi, Kofufu, however you pronounce it, you damn lovely supporters. It's a song going out to you, to you. Stephanie Taylor, Mrs. B. Esatea, Adam, Katie, Liv Dempsey, Becca, Jenford, Susie, Brown, and Sio, Ned, Chio, Rachel, I am Al, Jessica, Tom, Oakley, Tom, Brassington, Jessica, Tom, Oakley, Tom, Brassington, LJ, and last but not least, my lovely little Amy Bill, so they help us pay the bills, so a massive thank you out to Dabby family. Coffee supporters help us keeping it ad free. There's far more content coming just round the bend. Thank you all for helping our very special friends. Friends. Very special friends. What does a typical history lesson, and I know that might be an oxymoron, look like in your classroom this is where my answers have to be full of caveats because it, it depends entirely upon obviously a couple of factors number one we can't see history as just you know um a, ser a series of episodes i'm not going to repeat neil's simpsons versus game of thrones metaphor because he's he's made a living off that and fair play to him but i think it's pretty well known the other thing to be really, really aware, aware of is, well, how old are the children? Because the way in which children are going to learn is hugely varied between, you know, year one through to year six for various reasons. So the kind of I'm treating it as a sequence. So number one, we do need to start with context. Because if we treat history as that's you know, the stories uh, idea once again, well, what's the purpose of the early chapters of a story? Number one, it world builds. It builds the setting in which that happens. Then number two, we need to set out our story, you know, our narrative plot line. What's the difference between a story mountain and a, uh, and a timeline of history? Not a lot. There are, there are some subtle nuanced differences, but think about how you use story mountains when you're doing narrative writing in English. Are we do it using them for a similar approach in history? It is quite beneficial to do it more than once. You can't just make a timeline and expect them to get it. Can you imagine teaching, you know, number bonds, times tables, saying we've counted it once, therefore you've got it. I mean, it's nonsense. It's just not a thing. So when you've made your timeline, do you ever actually do you actually get children to understand the narrative? Do you keep coming back to it? Say this is right. So we've done chapter one. 
So where are we going next? Well, we're missing chapter two because it doesn't tie into our inquiry. That's why there's an interval between them. So now let's focus on chapter three and four. We're going to lump those together because they've got a similar theme. And by thinking about, you know, it's that kind of sequential, uh, you know, that sequential thinking as opposed to I want to do this, this, this and this. It allows us to form and kind of link effectively. So in terms of what we'd have in kind of the main body of a unit, let's go for, we need to get children to use source material. Because source material is how, you know, how our understanding of the past is constructed. Without source material, and I mean using a range of it across lessons, within lessons, um, to build a more detailed picture, we don't have history. It is the bread, and, you know, it's the building blocks from, you know, where we start from. But once we've gained that knowledge, we then need to do something with it. And this is why history is driven by questions. We've got that overall question that leads, let's say, a half term. But then we've got sub questions because we need clarity over. So now we've got this information. What are we going to do with it? It's that. So what? Once again, you know, because if we don't make use of it, are we encoding it into the long term memory? And if we kind of have that clarity of the lessons, we can then start to say, well, in this Roman period, this is what we've seen. Can anybody think of another connection to something we've previously learned about? But without clarity of vision, clarity of thought on that, either lesson by lesson or unit by unit basis, that's much harder. And when we draw conclusions, we need to use the historical discipline, which is what distinguishes between history and the other subjects. We need to think about the change, the causation, the consequence. The big one, and this does is re represented in the purpose of study, we do need to provide children the opportunity to have a bit of wiggle room. We do need to inspire people curiosity to know more. A, it's a requirement of the curriculum, but B, that's where passion and enthusiasm comes from. Me charging around Harlot Castle in North Wales with my brother, you know, being, I, I, I imagine, a pain. But that's where we can get that real depth, that passion, that enthusiasm from. And one of the things that I've seen quite a lot of, and I've got no problem with it, but it's how do we facilitate that if everything is provided in a booklet? And booklets are really useful. I can totally see the value of them. However, if we want to give them that freedom to learn and go, we need to ensure that's possible. Not just, re you know, read this block of text, look at this map, answer this question and repeat and repeat and repeat. That's a great start point. But let's expand beyond that. In the same way as you know, knowledge or knowledge organizers, I've got no issue with them. I've got no problem with them. But if it is done, and this is a stereotypical depiction, you know, of this is what we're learning next half term, learn these facts, then I'm going to quiz you on them, then I'm going to teach you them again, and then I'm going to quiz you on them again, and we're going to go half term, and then I'm going to quiz you on them again. Well, the chewing it over, the mulling it over, the so what could so easily be lost. And that's why enjoying is really key and stimulating conversations so powerful and I think it's something we need to be precious of I think it's something we need to be very deliberately emphasizing now are we going back to KWL grids no good grief no because asking a child that doesn't know anything what do you want to learn about this very abstract concept and idea is not inherently very helpful because strangely enough you get really bonkers answers when I was teaching more of my favorite one we got every time what pants did they wear don't know mate don't care either because it doesn't really matter does it what pets did they have because they're using that you know that knowledge base that basis from which to draw upon to think well that matters to me so did it matter to them and that's why just you know in some lessons, it'll be really instructive because I've got to give them the basis from which we expand outwards. It's that rippling outwards again. Um, so I was re when I wrote the when I wrote the book, I was rereading Why Don't Students Like School, and I really enjoy the fact it you know that William puts in there is a place for discovery, but you've got to use it very carefully and very sparingly because it does need to be curated in order for it to have value. What role does cognitive science play? Because I think you've almost touched on it quite a few times there. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's a really interesting thing because I um, on um, Twitter, which we're definitely going to still call it um, on Twitter, lots 
there was quite a few kind of secondary, mainly, you know, secondary specialists in history talking about that the, is it, oh gosh, the early career framework, that's what it's called, isn't it? Um, in the ECF, they were saying, this is all well and good, but the subject disciplines matter too. Now, for a secondary model, which Brent, obviously they're going, you know, that that really in-depth, nuanced model that children go to take them towards, you know, exam specifications is so powerful and useful. From a primary point of view, good luck, that's 12 subjects. So it's one of those ones where what I like to think about cognitive science is it offers us a framework and it adds to our toolkit that we can draw upon, we can utilise and that it's going to support learning in general. However, we then need to look and go, so what does this mean for this subject? Because an art lesson is very different to a history lesson and you know, rightly so. Most of the ones I've read, I really, a uh, quick shout out, I really like the In Action series that I think Tom Sherrington edits. I think they're, they're brilliantly put together, but they're not those kind of broad, they're broad principles from which we need to take, draw down and go, so what does it mean for this subject and this subject and this subject? So it's that sense of going, it's that how our school is going to deliver lessons, but we need the subjects to go, hello. Yeah, we work this way too, please. And the working, you know, the being in line with one another. And that's why, um, one of the reasons why I deliberately put in the worked example chapters at the end of the book in order for the teachers to look and go, so he's saying that chronology works in small steps because it's a complex process that we need to have lots of, you know, kind of prerequisite knowledge and thinking of. But what does this mean for my key stage one unit? what does this mean for my key stage two unit? And that's why I think it's really important that we don't just say, here's a theory, but we give kind of examples of, and this is how it might play a role in, you know, in this. For example, um, mentioned before, you know, story mountains and timelines, the graphic organizers, um, organize ideas by Ollie Cav and David Goodwin's a brilliant book to just drop into and go, how can I structure and support that line of thinking? You know, cognitive load theories, it's a game changer when you really start to think about it. And it's, you know, that, you know, when you, I look back now and think when I was teaching, thinking it's no wonder some of my kids just sat there going because they, they had reached overload. And that's why it's kind of doing, you know, doing it in different ways. But once again, it's not telling experienced, brilliant teachers exactly how to do things. It's going this is a theory that has got an evidence base behind it. It is useful to consider. And that's why that, you know, professional quality of that professionalism going, well, hang on, I'm going to use this for this purpose, for this reason. And that's why when I teach, when I do chronology workshops, I will always say to people, I'll say, These are, this is the research I'm using, but I'm not going to tell you how I'm using it till you've done it, because then you'll have that sense of, Oh, yeah, this did make things easier. The big one that I think I need, I'm still working on, still really thinking about, is that how I can really effectively deliberately connect concepts. You know, having that concept, that mental schema in the brain where we just look and go, hmm, I've got this bit, this bit, and this bit. How do I connect that when it's contextually so different? That's the bit that I think, I mean, I personally haven't got there yet, but it's that kind of thinking out loud that I, I call it an I wonder moment. And I don't know where I got it from, but it wasn't my idea initially. It's I, I wonder. And it's that going, I wonder if there's a crossover here. And, you know, in, in writing, we, we talk, we do it all the time when we think about word selection. Well, let's do it in the foundation curriculum too. If we think, oh, hang on, I've I watched or I listened to something that mentions and showing them how we can, you know, thinking. Another phrase that I use uh, a lot, especially for children who struggle to give an answer unless they're certain and I've already been told they're right, is I'm not sure, but. And it's a really useful phrase where we're just getting them to go, I'm being brave and having a go. I don't want this interrogating. Thank you very much. I'm just merely thinking out loud and kind of stepping outside my comfort zone. And that's where we can't just think about cognitive science in isolation. We do need to think about kind of pupil develop, you know, child development. Because if you, um, uh, Emma Turner's got a book coming out about co primary teaching and cognitive science. If we look at the kind of real data and the, the sample groups for a lot of the, the really dominant forces in education, how much of this is primary tested on? 
and how much is secondary because a 14 year old and a four year old quite different so it, that's why i always use it as a guide and an in and a start point but let's not see it as the be all and end all because it's a part of the puzzle the things you're doing are you're, you're trying to guide people thinking because you can't make them make those connections but the, the situations you're providing for them or the the ways you're drawn on what you've read and written in research and things is sort of well, how can we make them think about this subject and i think one of the themes that sort of you know these seasons all often have i don't know if it's incidental or accidental but the specificity you know and the, and the importance of context when taking things like cognitive science um has has come up a few times and i think yeah particularly in primary and um, we've got to consider you know the the vast expanse of age but also the vast expanse of um, subjects that are required and how we're thinking in different ways with the same source material how do we how do we apply that and there's a chapter in your book that that really stands out to me and it's concerned with world building but this feels to me like the kind of thing that enthusiasts are naturally drawn to if you had to convince someone who was less than enthusiastic that considerations of world building were say an effective use of time what would you say to them? So I'm going to give you a really short answer and then I will elaborate in more detail. What good is a story without a setting? The answer is you'll get the basics, you'll get some sense, but you lose huge amounts. And that's why we need to have that clear sense of what, you know, of world. The, Mike Hill wrote a, a beautiful blog on this a while ago, uh, all about world building, where he compares thing, you know, compares, you know, the work of Tolkien, who is the master of crafting over detailed, in my humble opinion, uh, settings. But it's it's really powerful to start thinking, well, not just what was the world like, but also what were the implications of that, you know, for the development of humanity. The other the thing to be really mindful of when we're teaching history is it is abstract. A child in year one has, you know, they probably have got no memory pre of a world pre-COVID. They probably don't have a memory of the start of that necessarily. Let's go all the way to the top, you know, the top of primary school. They're 11. That takes us back to 2012. That means although the London Olympics seems really recent to us, and I apologise if this makes people feel really old, but it, you know it's quite an important fact. Um, they that's potentially when they were born. They don't know a world without high speed broadband. They don't know a world without Xbox Live. They don't know about a world, heaven forbid, without Amazon Prime delivery service. That's why we need to craft the world in more than just a physical geography sense. So when we, you know, primary teachers for this next part will think, oh yeah, we do that already, but they might not have done kind of that connectivity between you know physical geography into the human story so if we you know use the example of the early ancient civilizations let's say well they're all located next to at least one river great so what well that's drinking water great but we miss out floodplains what the floodplains lead to agriculture what does agriculture lead to food surplus that means you can do more than just exist now, if we go back to the most abstract, um, you know, the most abstract is prehistory, because it's the earliest. We're taking about two and a half, three million years with seven year olds who, if you do this in autumn time, are probably still coming to terms with the lack of free milk and fruit and the fact that they don't get an afternoon playtime anymore. It's complicated cognitively. It's it's so far out beyond our comfort zone. I can't get my head around, you know, what three million years means. And I can tell you what the number is. I probably could give you the place value in various ways, but the actual meaning, and that's why we've got to be deliberately, uh, deliberately craft the world in which things happened. That's why resources like BBC Teach, they've got a great series called The Story of Britain, and it is just an extract of life in different time periods. They're not perfect. There's the odd mistake in that spotted, like um, in the Mesolithic one, they've got cave paintings on the wall, and it's called The Story of Britain but there aren't cave paintings like that in Britain. So it's, you know, but it's that start point. But beyond that, it's how that shapes humanity. The fact that, you know, Britain was connected to uh, Europe by a land bridge, but it's not anymore. So that means they could, they became isolated. They couldn't travel across without boats anymore. The fact that, you know, um, a common one, I've definitely fallen into this, 
is the fact you know to get the allowing the children to look at the Athenian democracy and say it wasn't fair because women couldn't vote in isolation well that's very fair that's very true it wasn't fair because women couldn't vote however if we don't teach them that well actually it's a heck of a lot fairer than the other alternatives like monarchy or the Spartan oligarchy we've missed the point if we don't tell them that um equal enfranchisement in this country is within living memory as in it's less than 100 years ago it's like 95 i think why would they know that so the world they occupy today is very different to then it doesn't make them wrong but it also doesn't mean that we're the pinnacle upon which everything else is judged it's called presentism and it's really it's potentially dangerous because it puts now on a pedestal i mean if we think about the last you know Five to ten years, we've got no right to call ourselves, put ourselves on a pinnacle. Um, Ian Dawson, uh, he wrote an article for Teaching History in 2009, and it calls a sense of period. So it's more than just Egypt's hot, dry, arid desert. It's that sense of, well, so what was life like? And if we have that grounded sense of the so what life was like this, then it allows that knowledge to flow more naturally because we're placing it within that realm in which it happened. You know, it's like, you know, character swap in a film. You know, if you put Arnie, put Arnie in a, you know, in a, a rom-com, let's say, he probably has done that. He's got a very large eclectic backlog, uh, back catalog as that man. It, it wouldn't, you know, it wouldn't work. The Terminator is obviously a very different film, you know, to, uh, and it's just focusing in on life was different. It doesn't make them wrong necessarily. You can't put your modern value judgment on them. Um, so that's why world building is so key. It doesn't always work. Um, if you're doing like changes within living memory and you look at something like toys, world building for toys is different to how it would be for the Great Fire of London because you're looking at kind of an aspect of society and technology in isolation. So what you'd look at in terms of world building there is the fact that there were multiple family organization groups, societal classes would have different, you know, things. If you read like a story, um, you might find that, um, you know, it does tend to be that 2.4 children, very middle-class home. There were others out there then too. That representation, you know, is it, it does matter then as well. I'm um, doing a project um, about material culture uh, with a, uh, a lecturer from the University of Lincoln, Lincoln looking at um, Joseph Banks, who was the botanist on Captain Cook's voyages, and just looking at the world building through a painting. In this enormous painting that's in Lincoln, Gal uh, one of the Lincoln galleries uh, or museums, and he's covered in Polynesian regalia but he's a white European and it's that world building to go well this white European is choosing to present himself in a way because that is how they were presented at the time we can we can look back at that and go oh that's grim no they definitely shouldn't have been treated in that way but let's think about they did the fact that people didn't view it in that way at that time I mean I defy anyone to listen to that response and not to be convinced as to the power of world building. I mean, my earliest memories are from the mid to late nineties. So I've only, ever, for a while, I only ever really known a new labor government, you know, a Britain that was, that was ruled by labor and Tony Blair. Um, and then it was only really after not this most recent spate of general elections where we had loads in a short period of time, but I sudden I, I sort of looked at the history of English politics and I realised that actually, no, the uh, the country more times than not, than not will vote for the, the Conservative Party. Um, and, it was, and that was sort of my current world was shaped by learning more about the, the previous world. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I think that relates to the to what you were oh, saying. It about. totally does. And it's that, I mean, the Conservatives, the most successful political party um, by far. They absolutely are. But it's it's looking at the fact that there have been different, you know, inc the different incumbent prime ministers have done things differently. I'm not going to go down the political rabbit hole of the last few years because we all can smirk and grimace in equal measure at that. But it's that sense of there are different branches of history. So when we talk about world building, it's a really useful one for societal history, but also political history. And you know, the, the main, you know, uh, political system you'll encounter across Key Stage 2 is forms of monarchy. The fact, you know, if we think Iron Age, Iron Age kings, Iron Age kings and queens, well, they were monarchs, pharaoh, theocratic monarch. 
the Roman emperor wouldn't have called himself a monarch, I don't imagine, but there's a really strong sense of monarchy there. And it, it's one of those ways when we can, it allows us to look beyond that, you know, that episodic unit of history. It allows us to make those connections across. Um, aim number six of the national curriculum is often missed because it's the top of page two, whereas the other five are on page one. But it's that connectivity by looking at these broad, you know, these broad concepts, but also world building allows us to look at them in their own right. Because if we were to teach nothing but homes through time, role of women through time uh you know trade through time in isolation we wouldn't have the necessary context in order for them to be able to go oh so it, it avoids isolated snapshots and that's something to be really careful yeah it, it's a it's like almost like a three-dimensional yeah it's a world yeah, that's <laughs> that i'm gonna steal that <laughs> What are your guiding principles for historical inquiry? Okay, so when I deliver training sessions and I mention the word inquiry, early years teachers ears prick up going, oh, we know about that. We do that lots. There is a very specific difference between the two. They are not the same thing. Inquiry, as in that pedagogical approach, is not the same as historical inquiry. A more natural um, way of aligning would be something like working scientifically. So historical inquiry is the process by which we study the past. It's akin to how a historian studies the past, but obviously very different because a historian has vast array of things that they use that we uh, children aren't going to be. So the guiding principles I use, are, and I've mentioned uh, these before, uh, a couple of these before, is number one, the question needs to be rooted in the historical discipline, as in it needs to be historically valid. If it's not historically valid, then is it historical inquiry? Because historical inquiry is an overlap of kind of knowledge and skills or, you know, substantive and disciplinary knowledge, however we choose to phrase it. The reason why I describe it in such a specific way is because that's what it is. It's a guided process. And that's where the idea that analogy came from, that the teacher is the narrator of the story, because the teacher knows where we're heading with this. The children are guided towards having that. Because as we've spoken about, history is hard. It's conceptually very difficult. The fact that we've got huge swathes of stuff that we don't really understand or know. We've got fragmentary, you know, a fragmentary basis that we're drawing upon. Therefore, we can't just get the children to go, oh, here's this one thing. Therefore, it means that because it doesn't work that way. That's why I used the analogy before of building, you know, that picture of the past. And that's why the what of the curriculum and how of the curriculum is driven by these clearly defined questions. Uh, Michael Riley's got uh, he's got like three principles um, he uses for what makes a good inquiry question. It was written for a key stage three article, but it's really useful. It's um, well, I'll probably butcher these now, but never mind. It's uh, number one. Is it going to capture their interest and attention? Because if they don't care, they're not going to put the effort in. Now, that's a very, you know, very blunt way of putting it. But we could talk about, you know, generating meaning being a better way to get things into long term memory go with whichever description you wish number two does it have that process that concept that historical idea at its heart it needs to do that and can the question be answered because if it can't be answered what's the point of the question and that's where some schools who are still using a topic-led approach which is totally fine absolutely no problem with it at all what they need to think about is can we have a really broad kind of philosophical question for the wider topic well yeah yeah, if you wish, don't mind that at all. But the history needs to be driven in that kind of clear sense, you know, clear sense. And it also needs to play a central role in the whole, throughout the whole teaching sequence. So what we need is we need to kind of really establish that connection between question into knowledge into answer. And we need to constantly renew that connection because if we don't, it can fall apart so easily. If we go on a tangent that takes us away from that question, then we can say, that was really interesting, wasn't it? However, remember, our core focus, our core thinking principle is towards, you know, towards that, really. Now, 
when I talk about the historical discipline, that's where aim four and five of the curriculum are the ones to look at for this particular question. If we've got a change question in there, so how did Britain change during prehistory? Then what we do is we'd say, where have we encountered change in history before? Where have we encountered continuity to establish that this is what drives our conclusion? So then at the end of each lesson, I would say, so what changes have we observed? And you can't, I personally wouldn't teach an aspect of life in isolation. As I said before, I wouldn't do homes and then society and then food because you need the story. So what we do there is we'd come back and say, and you'd build that picture over time. So in terms of those guiding principles, it's clearly defined historically valid question. It's a really clear and consistent connectivity between question into knowledge into answer, and it's ensure that there is something happening with the knowledge, that connecting it back to the question over time. If there's, for early years teachers out there, please don't think that I'm telling you that's how it should look in early years, because I don't think early years in most ways should be using such a formal rigid approach because their curriculum model is totally different. Are there some elements that we can draw upon, like the use of change, cause, et cetera? Yeah, totally. But inquiry key stage one onwards would be my main suggestion. Yeah, I mean, I don't think anyone in early years is going to listen to your explanation and think that you were, you were trying to espouse how they should, should behave with their children. And, um, you know, not least because, you know, three, four, five-year-olds should get in the hang of who they are. You know, yeah. Let's, let's sort that before we, you know, yeah. Any, anything but, I mean, else really. The history curriculum does unofficially start in early years. Um, the recent Ofsted subject report spoke about one of the uh, one of the things that's not quite there yet in early years is the fact that they're doing lots of introduction to chronology, the difference between now and past, but they're not doing it through historical lenses. So for early years, if they were well, my favourite example to use that I use loads is if you're reading the story of Cinderella, well, let's do a comparison of Cinderella's kitchen to their kitchen at home. How do we know Cinderella is set in the past? Well, she's cooking on a cauldron over a fire. How many of you have got a cauldron over a fire at home? No, you haven't. No, no. Look, photo. And it's that sense of, you know, we need that, that, that context for the stories and they can start sooner. If you read a, you know, a carrot like Cinderella's got a prince in it. Well, let's use that to introduce the concept of monarchy. Saying who's got, but really simply, who's got the most power in our story? Oh, the king does. Well, do you want to know what that's called? That's called a monarch and a monarchy. We've still got one today because Britain's a bit backward. Sure, why not? You know, King Charles III, he is a king. That means he is the head of state. He's got the most power in this country. And we can build those blocks over time through different contexts. Now, one thing you've mentioned quite a few times, and I had something similar in my last book where I had tasks for people because I wanted to almost act like a surrogate for not being there with the person. So here's the task I would set you if I give you this information in person, you know, like when I'm working on teachers in my, in my schools. And um, you've got worked examples at the towards the end of the book, if not the very end. How do you hope they'll be used? So the worked examples are there as a supportive guide into what primary history kind of, you know, what primary history is, but also this is how it can look in these two specific ways. It is not, not to be seen as, you know, like a, an all singing, all dancing scheme of works. That's not what it's for, but it's a case of going, this is the theory. This is the principle by which I'm working with. This is what I'm advocating for. And this is how you might do it. This is how it could look. This is how it may look in the classroom. But as I mentioned before, it's not to be just picked up and used. It's a way to illustrate a point. And that's how I hope they, you know, they come across because everything has to be tweaked and tailored to, to specific examples. With the support you provide our readers and taking them on their journey, I think that'll be really clear. Um, but I was just interested in your thought process um, and if there's anything that, you know, was driving that decision along alongside the worked examples um were the where have i gone wrong uh, sections and it was as a profession i think we're used to taking a kicking and i didn't want to put in these are things if you're doing you wrong so i wanted to kind of use the book as a as a reflective tool 
Um, that's why I think I put in the last chapter, it was quite cathartic writing those bits because it's a chance for me to say, this is what I used to do. And this is why I now th do things differently. And it's that sense of with the worked examples and these are things to look out for. It's just looking carefully and going, I've changed the way I do things. Let me explain to you why and why I would suggest these are a more effective way to do them, as opposed to just, you know, another kicking of if you're doing this, you're wrong and you're terrible. Because I don't, A, I don't think that's particularly helpful. And B, I just, I, you want to take people along with you. You want to guide them into an approach that you believe in, as opposed to saying, if you do this, you're great. If you do that, you're wrong. Because it's always the, you know, the nuance always matters. Yeah, and teaching is a career of gradual evolution. So mm. we have to get used to the fact that our ideas from X number of years ago will, might, might not, con, not compute, but uh, correlate with what we think now, you know, with, like we said, with better better experiences, better advice from people, you know. So I think that's, it's really important. And I think, yeah, I, I really enjoyed the uh, where I've gone wrong sections because, you know, I think people will look to you and think, you know, people look at social media in particular and they think things are fantastic. You know, we see the best side and that that honesty is massive, you know, and I think um, it's certainly something we try to do in the podcast, talk about how bad mm. we've got things wrong in the past, because, boy, if I got <laughs> yourself, why have I got things wrong? <laughs> Haven't we all? It's, uh, you know, it's the idea of warts and all. You know, Cromwell was a vile person in so many ways, but the fact that he insisted he was painted warts and all was such a difference to, you know, portraiture of the, the monarch's, um, that he'd uh, he'd replaced, re you know, really. And it's that, I always think, to me, integrity really matters, which is why, although if I take a photo of me delivering a training session, um, I will always look at it and go, do you know what? Yeah, that's terrible. I'm going to retake that. But in a kind of contextual manner, if I've done something wrong and I've learned from it, then I will share that because it's powerful. You know, learning from mistakes, is a, it's a really important thing that we do. Not sure um, integrity is going to get Cromwell off the hook with uh, our Irish listeners, but uh, rightly so. <laughs> that's for another day and perhaps <laughs> another type of podcast. <laughs> Just a, a little different. <laughs> There's one question I, I can't really let you go without asking you. Do you feel any remorse for the chronology pun made on page 106 of your book? And do you have anything to say to listeners as a result? Uh, do I have any uh, remorse? Absolutely not. Do I have anything to say? You're welcome. N now, just behind the, you know, the break in the fourth wall here, when, when, I, when, I, when you kind of mentioned this question before, I actually looked up about famous people at punned. If puns and wordplay were good enough for Shakespeare, and across his work there are many hundreds of them, then they're good enough for me. I mean, that's me told. Is that, is, is that's all she wrote is that, was that Shakespeare <laughs> something like that there was some, honestly if you ever if you've ever need to just uh, melt your brain slightly with silliness Shakespearean puns and wordplay there are some utterly beautiful and ridiculous examples in oh there's going to be uh there's going to be a Shakespearean puns TikTok or something isn't that I'm going to get sucked into <laughs> just be flicking through people <laughs> making videos about these puns <laughs> <laughs> if there isn't get yourself making it it has been an absolute pleasure. Um, and this conversation going for a couple more hours, I reckon. You know, I say this a lot, but I genuinely mean it. Um, lots of different alleyways we've gone down. and But really, get into the, like you say, you, you, your passion for history comes through massively. And uh, I know listeners will find it really, really useful. Um, all set to do say thank you very much for joining me. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thoroughly enjoyed the conversation. And everyone at home, until next time, thanks for listening. Mm -hmm.